All right, here in, uh, in the book of Acts, we're starting off. It's a brand new book. Of course, on Wednesday nights is our Bible study where we go through a book of the Bible. We go chapter by chapter. We do one chapter every week. And this week, we're starting off the book of Acts. And, you know, I chose the book of Acts to start with because the book of Acts is my favorite book of the Bible. There's, I mean, I, of course, I love the whole Bible. I love everything about it. But um, for some reason, the book of Acts, I just, I love all the action. I mean, that's why it's called the book of Acts, because Acts is, is the actions, basically, of the apostles. This is all the great things that they did after uh, Jesus Christ was resurrected and he was gone, and they were endued with power to go out and do all these mighty works. And, and they truly weren't afraid of men, and they did all these things. They were beaten up, they were thrown in prison, they were preaching great sermons. There was all kinds of, of you know, miracles, they were healing people, and it's just a really exciting book. And I remember when, um, very shortly after I started going to Faithful Word Baptist Church, I was having a conversation with Pastor Anderson, and um, I was explaining, you know, just that, that the book of Acts was my favorite book, and, and why I loved it so much, and, and how, how cool it would be today to see people, you know, going about and, and, and healing people, and just doing all these great things, just turning the world upside down, as we're going to see later in the book of Acts that that's what they were doing. And, um, you know, I'll never forget, and I don't remember the words verbatim, but, but basically what he had told me is, he said, well, why can't we have that today? He's saying there's no reason why we can't have that today. All it takes is for people like you and you and me and everybody else, anybody who wants to, you know, we need to take it on ourselves to obey God, to follow his commandments, to have faith in him, and let God do great things because ultimately it wasn't by these men, it wasn't by their own power that they did all these great things. It was by the power of God. And God's power is still available today to those that have faith in Him, to those that, that are willing to be used by Him and that will be able to clean up their life and be able to uh, be a vessel meet to be used by God. And, and that kind of struck me, you know, the, that there is no reason. God... God is not has not shut up any miracles. He's only limited by us. We shouldn't be limiting God. God is limitless. God is limitless in His power, and the only thing that would limit Him is, is our faith. And God can do all the same miracles He's done in the past. He could do all the same things today, and I'm sure He would love to. His power is made perfect in weakness, and He's just looking for people to stand up and to say, you know what, use me, God. I'm right here. I, I want to do work for you. And, you know, hopefully that's what we can do here with this church is to, to find many like-minded believers who want to go and serve God. And we can, we can turn this city upside down with the doctrine of the Bible. Now let's look at um, verse number one there, chapter number one. The Bible reads, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments under the apostles whom he had chosen. So here we see this letter, this, this book that's being written, is being addressed to Theophilus. And he's the author of this, of this letter is explaining that the former treatise have I made of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Basically what we see here is that this book is being written by, by the same author as the, as the author of the Gospel of Luke which was Luke. So in Luke chapter number 1, we use this evidence to see in Luke chapter number 1 and verse number 3, the Bible says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So the book of Luke and the book of Acts were both addressed to Theophilus. And the book and the author of the book of Acts makes it clear that that he's the same author that that wrote the former treatise about Jesus and his life and his ministry and everything else that he did, which is all can, recorded in the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> Let's continue reading here in, in verse number three. It says, "To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days." and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. This is a key, a key verse here because 
it's a key doctrine of the faith that Jesus Christ physically arose from the grave. It wasn't just his spirit that arose. Because we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus Christ, of course, died on the cross, bearing the sins of the whole world. He died and, and his body was buried in a tomb. The Bible also explains that his soul descended into hell for three days and three nights. But after his death, after his burial, was of course his resurrection three days after he was dead. And it wasn't just his spirit, but it was also his body. And it explains here in verse 3, it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Now an infallible proof is a Loctite proof. Infallible means it can't fail. There's no way you can look at this proof and say by any, by any means that, oh, that's not valid, or you're not considering this, or, or oh, no, that's not right because, you know, you didn't use enough evidence or whatever. An infallible proof is something that is just beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's no doubt about it. Jesus Christ was physically resurrected. It is infallible proof. And he was seen of them 40 days, it says, speaking of, of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, because we're going to see how important this doctrine is that Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead. Because this is the gospel, this is part of the gospel, and this is what you need to believe in order to be saved. I mean, this is critical, a critical doctrine that we need to understand. And 1 Corinthians 15 helps explain this. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So, of course, we're saved by the gospel. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So he's going to explain the gospel which saves you, which is what he also received. It was given to him. It's not something he came up with on his own. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's the first thing we need to know. According to the, you know, the Gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins in verse number 3. And of course, the Scriptures prophesied of this. Verse number 4, and that he was buried. So Jesus Christ was buried in the ground. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then it continues on and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So he's saying, look, Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And he was seen by many, many people. He was seen by over five hundred people at the very same time. These are, are probably a lot of the infallible proofs that happened when Jesus Christ was on this earth, proving that he physically resurrected from the dead. And I'm going to get into why this is, this is really key, because it was, besides just being a basic part of the gospel, you know, the resurrection is really important for us to understand, because there's going to be another resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection of, of the just and the unjust. And Jesus Christ being the first fruits is extremely important for, for other doctrinal issues. Now, the Jehovah's false witnesses today, they don't believe that Jesus Christ physically rose from the grave. And it's actually completely ridiculous. Go ahead and turn to John chapter number 20. John chapter 20. It's insane to me. I mean, they really just have no regard for the Bible or God's word at all. Because there's so many places that just irrefutably state that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And we're going to see one of them right here. And this is probably one of the best proofs that we have. In John chapter 20, Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead. Now they'll, like to, they'll try to tell you that, oh yeah, Jesus walked around in a physical body, but it wasn't Jesus' real body. Which is just stupid, because we're going to see right here in, in John chapter 20. Look at verse number 24. This is, this is a story of Doubting Thomas, right? A lot of people have heard of Doubting Thomas. Even if you don't know the story, you probably heard the phrase Doubting Thomas. Because Thomas is the disciple of Jesus Christ that said that, look, unless I can put my fingers into the holes of his hands where he's nailed to the cross and put my hand into the side where they pierced him, he said, I'm not going to believe. He doubted. 
He doubted when the other disciples came and said that Jesus Christ had risen from the, from the dead. Look at verse number 24 of John chapter 20. The Bible reads, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and, believe, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So here we see Jesus Christ comes, and he proves it to Thomas. He's able to say, Okay, Thomas, here, you wanted proof, here I am. Touch me, touch the holes in my hands from where they, where they nailed him to the cross. Put your hand into my side where they pierced me. In order for Jesus Christ to come back, I mean, it, it, it's stupid to think that he came in another body that also had, was crucified and also had the same, the same wound on his side. This is obviously the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ physically arose from the dead and of course spiritually rose from the dead. After he paid for our sins, he rose again from the dead and he was able to physically show that this is what happened. Now you can, I want you to keep a finger in there in John chapter 20. We're going to be coming back to it. And uh, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 6 and just explain a little bit briefly why this doctrine is so important about the physical resurrection from the dead. Because as I alluded to earlier, it's going to affect our um, you know, doctrine based on our resurrection that's coming up when, um, when Jesus Christ comes back again. In Romans 6 verse 3, the Bible reads, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection." So Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection shows a lot more than, than just him physically coming back to life. I mean, it shows that he conquered death and hell. And it also shows us here, this is the whole reason why we baptize people. This is what, what the reason why we're Baptist. We baptize people because what baptism is, is a picture of Jesus Christ's death when you're standing up in the water, his death on the cross, his burial when you go under the water, and then his resurrection again when you come up out of it. That he says, that it's saying here in Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now, notice too, it says that we should. It doesn't say that we will walk in newness of life. It says that we should. Not everybody that gets saved by putting their faith in Jesus Christ is going to, to live the way that they ought to. Many, peop many people, many believers continue to sin. They continue to, to just satisfy the lusts of their flesh. That doesn't make them not saved. The Bible says here that we should walk in newness of life. Absolutely we should. And we ought to. And that's something we ought to strive to be doing. And, um, you know, the, the baptism, when someone gets baptized, is a symbol of that. And I think that happens a lot of time in people's life. You know, especially when, when you put off getting baptized after you get saved. You know, you ought to get baptized immediately. You ought to get baptized right away. That's the way that God designed it. There should be no waiting around. You shouldn't have to take a class or do anything else to get baptized. Look, once you get saved, once you believe on Jesus Christ, you ought to get baptized. Now, I'm one that waited. I got, bat I got saved when I was 20 years old. And it wasn't until I was about 29 years old where I actually got baptized. And I'll tell you what, that baptism, after that baptism, was also when I decided that I was going to walk in newness of life. Because up to that point, I was still living a wicked lifestyle. I was still living in sin. It was not right, but I was still saved. Jesus Christ still sealed me with the earnest of the Holy Ghost. All of my sins were forgiven. But after that baptism, I don't know what it is about baptism, but you know, the Bible kind of goes over it here. You know, I was 
demonstrating and showing a picture of Jesus Christ's burial and his resurrection from the dead through that baptism. And that's also a turning point in my life when I decided, you know what, I'm going to walk in newness of life. And that's something we all ought to do. Now we're going to get into this, to this a little bit later as well, though, about the resurrection, because it's going to come up again real shortly here in the book of Acts. But I'm going to keep on reading here. Stay, stay in um, John chapter 20 if you're still there. I'm going to keep reading Acts chapter, or chapter 1 verse 4. It says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now we see here in verse 4 that Jesus is instructing them. He's telling them, okay, look, you guys got to wait in Jerusalem. Okay, I don't want you doing anything else. You need to wait there. And you're going to wait for the promise of the Father. He's saying, what you've heard of me, the promise is going to come. Just wait in Jerusalem for it. And he said, look, John baptized with water. He said, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. So real shortly, stick around in Jerusalem because the Holy Ghost is going to come and baptize you. Now, a baptism, the way, and the reason, again, baptism means immersion. It's full immersion. We don't do sprinkling when we baptize people. It's a full immersion. You go completely under the water and you come back up again. And the baptizing of the Holy Ghost is going to be the same thing. They're going to be baptized. It's going to be this, this external baptism of the Holy Ghost bringing the power of God upon them, which is very different than the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. If you're still in John chapter 20, look at verse number 22. Verse number 22 of John 20. This is where we see when believers first were indwelled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 22 says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them. He's talking, about, he's talking to his disciples. When he said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I believe from this moment forward, this is when people started being indwelled by the Holy Ghost. So he's obviously in Acts chapter 1, he's not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Ghost if he's telling them to wait for it and that it's going to come when they had already received this in John chapter 20. And of course, John chapter 20 is way before the events of Acts chapter number 1. Now, continuing on in the book of Acts, and this is going to be important too because based on all the things that they do, there's a lot of false doctrines surrounding Acts chapter 1 and 2. We're going to get really into that in Acts chapter 2 with the Pentecostals and their tongue-speaking movement, and it's, it's of the devil, and I'm going to prove that. And it's, those are not, people rolling around on the ground is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not a gift of the Holy Ghost. It's not something that you, and that's definitely not something you get when you get saved. But we're going to go over that next week when we go into chapter 2. But chapter 1, it's important that we understand here that they're just going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And we're going to see what that means. So I'm going to continue reading here in verse number 6. It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the power they're talking about, this, this baptism of the Holy Ghost, what this is going to allow them to do, it says they're going to receive power when the, when the, when the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes. And what are they going to receive power to do? It says, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They're going to receive power to be a witness of Jesus Christ, a witness of his death, a witness of his burial, a witness of his resurrection. They're witnesses of everything that Jesus Christ did. They're going to go and preach the gospel to the lost. And he said, wait for me in Jerusalem, because in order to do this, you need to be endued with power from on high. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. Look, if we're going to be, if we're going to be successful out soul winning, if we're going to do a good job, we need, to be in, we need to have the Holy Ghost power upon us. We can't do this in our own power. We need to go out with the power of the Holy Ghost. We need to get that power from on high in order to do anything for God. The same way that the disciples waited for God, they waited for the Holy Ghost, and what they did was they were together in one accord in one place. They prayed. They made supplications unto God. They were begging God. They were praising God. And God answered their prayers. And he brought the Holy Ghost. He baptized with them. And they were endued with power from on high to go out and be witnesses unto his name. 
And I like where it says here, all the places, it says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. So this is not just in your personal life. This is not just witnessing when it becomes convenient and when someone happens to walk in and you just have this perfect opportunity to give the gospel. Yes, you ought to give the gospel in that situation, but that's not the only time. The commandment here is to go out under the uttermost part of the earth. That's saying reach everybody. You need to go out and bring the gospel. You need to go out with the power of God, not just when it's convenient for you. You need to make the time to go and do it. You need to make it a priority in your life. You need to get the power of the Holy Ghost and go and be a witness for Jesus Christ. Let's continue reading on. Verse number 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand, stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, excuse me, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. <clears throat> now there's a couple important pieces of information here that we're going to point out about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So look at verse number 11. Right near the latter half, it says, um, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So he's saying, look, the same way that you just saw him right now, they're... so get the picture here, right? The disciples are there. They were just speaking with Jesus. Jesus Christ was just speaking with them. <sighs> Jesus Christ is leaving, and he's being taken up and received up into a cloud and received up into heaven. And everybody's just watching this event. They're just standing there watching up, probably in awe. Just, just, it's an amazing thing. Jesus Christ is just going up back into heaven. And two, two angels stand by. It says two men in white, in white apparel are there saying, and they, they show up and they ask him, hey, why, why do you just stand here all the day just gazing up into heaven? They tell him, look, the same way that you just saw Jesus Christ depart, is the way he's going to come back again. And we're going to point out two things of the way that they saw him go back. The first thing is in verse number 9. It says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So it's important to, to note there that a cloud received Jesus Christ out of their sight. It's going to be important for the next verse we're going to turn to. And then also in verse number 12, it says where they were, it says, Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. So when they had met with Jesus Christ and when they saw him go return up into heaven, they were at the Mount of Olives. They were at Mount Olivet. Now go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 24. Matthew 24, and we're going to see, and keep your finger in Acts chapter 1, because obviously we're going through the book of Acts, and I'm going to show you a few, these, these few um, key points here that are very similar between Acts chapter number 1 and Matthew chapter 24 about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the two points that we saw in Acts chapter 1 was that a cloud received Jesus out of their sight and that they were at Mount Olivet. And I think both of these are important. So look at Matthew 24 verse number 3. Matthew 24 verse number 3 it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives... The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So notice here in verse number 3 of Matthew 24, they're at the Mount of Olives, and then the disciples ask him, Hey, what shall be the sign of thy coming? They're asking him the very question that the, the, the men in white said that in like manner that you saw Jesus come, he's going he's to come again. So both of these chapters have to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ, with the coming of Jesus Christ, the return of Jesus Christ. Both of these have to do with that. Especially Matthew chapter 24 here. There's a lot more information in Matthew chapter 24. It's the same subject matter we see. They're both taking place at the Mount of Olives, which I believe is also significant. Look at verse number 30 of Matthew 24. It says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So here again, we see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, which matches up perfectly with Acts chapter 1, 
when the, the men in white told them that they were going to, the same way that they saw Jesus ascend up and he was received up into a cloud, is going to be the same way that he comes back the second time. And we see here in Matthew 24, as he's explaining the sign of his coming and of the end of the world, which is the, the answer that they were asking him in the beginning of the chapter. He's going to be coming in, in the clouds of heaven. Look at verse 31. It says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So here we see the rapture. Okay, the angels are going to gather together the elect. Now, I'm not going to get into it too much tonight, tonight for sake of time, but when it says the elect there, that's, that's basically every single believer. Okay, anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is God's elect. This is not just talking about some specific unbelieving Jew that God somehow miraculously is just going to save and, and contradict his own word about how a person is saved by grace through faith the way it's always been. Not of works us any man should boast. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. And that um, <clears throat> the elect is the, is the saved believers, the born again believers, and we see here that they're, that they're gathered together as Jesus comes back in the clouds. Here they're gathered together. And, um, and that's when the rapture takes place at Jesus Christ's second coming. Now, when does all this stuff happen? We'll look up just a, a couple verses to verse number 29. The Bible says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. So we see here, that the rapture event that was described, the second coming of Christ, that was described in Acts chapter 1, and is also described here in Matthew 24, comes after the tribulation. Now, a lot of people today are pre-tribulational. They think that Jesus Christ is going to come back prior to the tribulation. And I'll tell you right now, there is absolutely zero scriptural evidence that will show that Jesus Christ is going to come back anytime prior to the tribulation. And just so you know here, when, when um, Matthew 24 is talking about after the tribulation of those days, it's not just some random tribulation. This is talking about the great tribulation, which was mentioned just a little bit earlier. In verse number 21, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So here we see this is the great tribulation that is referred to in verse number 29 because it's right after the tribulation of those days is when Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds and he's going to gather together his elect and we're going to be caught up together with him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And this is prior to God pouring out his wrath on the earth. Don't mistake the events. A lot of people like to use the word tribulation and just, and just make it for a, a seven-year time period where all, and, and, and in their mind, what they think is that it's all just God pouring out and destroying the earth and doing all these things. When in fact, the tribulation is never, those events are never referred to as the tribulation. That's God's wrath being poured out. The tribulation is when the Antichrist decides to go after the saints and he got, decides to persecute them. And that's when the saints are becoming martyred for the, for the name of Jesus Christ. And for his gospel, that is the great tribulation. And that's what we see here. And you can read Matthew 24, and it's amazing. Read it in your own time. It all goes perfectly in order. And there's oftentimes, it's, it's usually words, and then. And then this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen. Showing you that it is um, in sequence. It's sequential, these events. They don't just happen. It's not just... Um, you know, some random collection of thoughts and they all take place at different times. No, of course not. God's not trying to deceive us or trick us. It's not something that requires that much effort to understand. He's telling us, Jesus Christ was telling his disciples when he's explaining the end, the end of times and he's explaining his second coming, what's going to happen. He gave it to him in order. And we see there that it's the, the great tribulation of those days. Now let's continue on in the book of Acts. In 
in verse number, where did we leave off? Verse number 13. And when they were coming, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So we see here, all the disciples are back together. They're meeting with the women, with Jesus' mother Mary, and with the brethren of Jesus Christ. It was, it was all his brethren are there now. And it says they're praying, they're making supplication to God, they're doing what, they, what he told them to do. They're, st they're in Jerusalem, and, and they're in this place. And this is where we catch up here in verse number 15, where, where Peter's going to start talking. And in verse 15, it says, And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. So there's 120 people. There's a church. The first church here is meeting. There's 120 believers, 120 people. <clears throat> Jesus stands up and he speaks. Verse 16, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue a seldoma, that is to say the field of blood. Now here we see, you know, this is right after Jesus Christ's resurrection. There's not a lot of time has gone forth. Now I'm sure there's a lot of things that are sinking in to the disciples' heads and they're starting to understand a lot more. You know, you remember um, when you read the Gospels, how much they just didn't quite get when Jesus was on this earth, when Jesus was trying to teach them and show them these things. They weren't able to receive everything yet because they didn't really come to pass. They didn't quite understand when Jesus Christ said that, that the Son of Man must die and you know be crucified and, and rise again the third day. They didn't quite know exactly what he was talking about. They didn't know a lot of the, the, the scriptural references and exactly how what they meant and, um, and how they were going to play out. But now after his, after his resurrection, you know I believe God opened up their understanding. Jesus taught, teaches them some more. And they're together and they're praying and they're making supplication. And now they're starting to see how all these things play together. I mean, they had the proof. They saw Jesus Christ rise again. They know for a fact that Jesus Christ was the Christ. He was the Messiah. And they're starting to understand and see the parallels and to see all the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament Scripture. Because they knew the Old Testament. And now they're starting to see, oh, okay, yeah, this meant this. So here we see Peter, Peter excuse me, is um, explaining... Why it was why it had to happen with what happened with Judas? Because if you remember, none of the disciples knew that Judas was going to be the one to betray Jesus. They all asked, "Is it I?" They didn't know that Judas was the traitor. That Judas was the one that was going to betray Jesus Christ. So all of this has to settle in. Still, I mean, if you think about it, you know these these twelve the twelve apostles when they were walking around with Jesus Christ and they were doing his ministry. I'm sure they all had a lot of interaction with Judas. And they probably, they probably knew him really well. Or they, at least they thought they did. And they probably felt close to him. So after this comes to light, and they're like, man, that guy was a devil. And we didn't even know it. You know, it, it has to sink in and, and they have to reflect on that and just understand that. And now here's where, where Peter is starting to understand. He said, look, this had to happen. And this had to happen because of the scripture here. It says in verse 19, and it says, And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, a seldom, that is to say, the field of blood. So he explains here all the things that happened where Judas, um, you know, he bought this field, basically he commits suicide, it says, um, falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gush out. So it was a really nasty, gross death, where all his bowels gush out, and, and it was horrible. And they called that field a seldom, because it was a field of blood. And, um, and then he says in verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms. So here's where he's tying in scripture saying, look, this had to happen because this was prophesied in the book of Psalms. Let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. 
So he brings up two references from the book of Psalms, and we're going to go through both of them. And we're going to see here the rest of the chapter, the reason why he's bringing this up is because now they decide, hey, we need to fill that slot that Jesus, Judas had. We need to, to, to get someone else in this spot. So he brings this up, and that's why he brings up that, the, the quote about his bishopric will have another take. But we're going to get to that one second. Let's go to our first section, Psalm number 69. There's a lot of reference here and a lot of foreshadowing and a lot of uh, prophecy about Jesus Christ in Psalm 69. In Psalm 69, we're going to see the, the, the quote about um, his habitation being desolate. But I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to read a pretty, a pretty significant portion of this, of this chapter because there's so much prophecy just, just packed into Psalm 69. We're going to start reading in verse number 7, and you're going to see lots of, lots of truths, lots of prophecies about Jesus Christ. And then we're going to get to verse 25 where, where this is quoted here in Acts chapter 1. And sorry, in verse number 7, the Bible reads in Psalm 69, Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Here's, here is a, a quote that's referenced later on in the... Um, in another part of the Bible where, you know, where Jesus Christ um, overturned the, the, the changers that, of the, the, money, the money changers, the tables of the money changers, and, um, and cast them out of the, the house of God. This verse was quoted here, for the zeal of that house had eaten me up. And that was already, this is already a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, which is explained elsewhere in the Bible. Verse 10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. He said, look, I wept, I chastened my soul of fasting, and people reproached him for it and looked out on him. I made sackcloth also my garments, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gates speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Jesus Christ was left all alone. At his worst hour, at the worst point of his life, Jesus Christ was left completely alone. It says, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Again, foreshadowing of Jesus Christ when he was crucified on the cross and they, they put up that vinegar for him to drink was prophesied right here in Psalm 69. Verse 22, let their table become a snare before them and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. So this is a curse. This is a curse being put on the people. The, the enemies of God, the enemies of Jesus Christ, the adversaries, we're going to see a curse here in Psalm 69, we're going to see a curse in Psalm 109. And that's why I bring this up, because we're tying this together with Judas Iscariot. That's why we're going through this, because Peter in the book of Acts here is, is explaining why all this stuff happened with Judas. Judas was the devil. Judas was a devil. He was, he was a, a devil from the beginning, the Bible says. And Judas was severely cursed. And we're going to see why, and we're going to see the types of people that are cursed and the curses that they receive. It says in verse 23, Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. And this is the verse that was quoted. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. Which is exactly what it says here. It says, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And that's referring to Judas Iscariot, which we're seeing here 
was prophesied in Psalm 69. It says, For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Listen to this curse. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. This is the curse that came upon Judas Iscariot. Judas was not saved. Judas was never saved. Judas was never a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, it's interesting. Even though Judas repented, he repented of the evil he had done to Jesus Christ. He came and threw the money back down and said, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with this. That's innocent blood that he betrayed. He felt bad about it. He felt so bad he went out and killed himself. He repented of that sin that he did. You know what? That didn't save him. His name was already blotted out of the book of life. He already had this curse that was prophesied in Psalm 69. Judas was reprobate before he even died when he betrayed the blood of Jesus Christ. He did not go to hell because he killed himself, as a Catholic might try to teach. That's not the reason why. The reason why he was an unbeliever, and not only that, he was a devil. He was, he was a reprobate. His book was blotted out of the book of life. He was never a believer. No, no amount of repenting of his sin was ever going to save him. He did not have the faith in Jesus Christ. It amazes me that anybody can say that, well, maybe Judas did get saved because he repented. You don't understand what repentance means then. You do not have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Now we're going to turn to the second reference, Psalm 109. And we're going to see some more serious cursing here in Psalm 109 that's directed at Judas and, and his like and his ilk. Psalm 109, we're going to start reading in verse number 6. It says, set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. The same way that Satan was standing at the right hand of Judas Iscariot. Satan was the one who even indwelled Judas when he went, when Jesus Christ said, that thou doest, do quickly. Satan was at his right hand. Satan was guiding Judas. Verse 7, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. This is some serious cursing. I mean, think about it. Think about a person that here in the book of Psalms is saying, when he's judged, let him be condemned. No mercy. He's condemned. Let him be guilty. And let his prayer become sin. Even just praying to God, let that become a sin. It says, let his days be few and let another take his office. So here, let another take his office. Again, this is the second portion that was quoted in the book of Acts. That Judas, um, that the disciples should let, you know, another person's going to take the office that Judas held, the bishopric, that says in the book of Acts. It says, let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. So they're saying he's gonna, he needs to die. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath. And let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Because that he remembered not to show mercy. So look, again, this is all, I believe you, be, you could apply this to Judas Iscariot. These are some serious curses. He's saying, look, don't even let the sin of his mother be blotted out. I mean, this is serious cursing on Judas, on his family, on his children. If you had children, I don't know if Judas had children or whatever. But um, the, these people that are adversaries, that are enemies of God, are being cursed here. It says that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Just completely wipe out the fact that they ever existed. And it says, why? Why? Because that he remembered not to show mercy. 
but persecuted the poor and needy man that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. Let it be unto him as the garment which covereth him, and for a girdle wherewith he is girded continually. Let this be the reward of mine adversaries from the Lord, and of them that speak evil against my soul. This is some very heavy cursing. This is cursing that came upon Judas Iscariot. Judas was not a good guy. Judas Christ, or Judas Christ, I'm sorry. Not, um, Judas Iscariot was a devil, and um, <clears throat> Judas Iscariot was a thief. Judas didn't care about the poor. When he had the bag, he was a treasurer. He was the one responsible for going out and, and, and giving alms and doing things for people. He didn't care about the people. All he cared about was lining his own pockets. He had contempt for the poor. He didn't have love for anyone. He definitely didn't have love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he paid suffering. He's, he's still suffering for that. He's paying for that penalty in hell. He's paying his punishment. And... Um, Let's continue on here with the rest of the chapter. We see those serious, serious um, cursings for Judas Iscariot. And I'll tell you what, we need to be aware because if Judas was allowed or was around in Jesus Christ's church, Judas is going to be around in, in, in any church. He could be in any church around today. And that's why you ought not to let your children out of your sight. And that's why you ought not to to trust man more than you ought to. We need to trust God. The Bible says, you know, let every man be a liar, but God is true, right? And I quoted that wrong, but... Um, <clears throat> we ought not to just trust somebody because, oh, well, they go to my church, so I'm going to trust them. Well, what if Judas was coming to this church? Would you say, oh, yeah, let's trust him too, that thief, that traitor, that betrayed Jesus Christ, that, that received all of these cursings, that God saw fit to receive these cursings of eternal punishment and judgment and torture and, and his name to be blotted out forever. Yeah. There are very, very wicked people on this earth, very wicked people that are reprobates concerning the faith. They can never be saved. They're monsters. Their, their, their heart is only to do mischief, only to do evil continually. And we got to be aware that these people exist. And you might not even know who they are. It might not be someone that, that's going to be someone that you can notice or recognize. Oh, yeah, that's an evil person. The disciples didn't know it. The only people that knew it was Jesus Christ. And he was God in the flesh, but, um, and he allowed that to happen. But the Bible says in Jude and it's in... Um, 2 Peter chapter 2, you can read all about the, the false prophets and the reprobates, how they're going to, to um, you know, come and, and, and eat with you, and they're going to be basically infiltrate the church. But let's continue on with the chapter here. Because <clears throat> now we're seeing, they're gonna, they need to make a decision. So it says at the end of verse 20, and his bishopric let, let another take. So this is why Peter's even bringing this up, is because now they're in a situation, you know, Judas is gone, Jesus Christ is gone, there's 11 apostles now, we need to fill that spot that Judas had. Peter understands the scripture, and he, and, and he understands this verse where it says, let another take it. So he's like, okay, well, we need to make a decision. We need to let someone else take this office that Judas was holding. It says, wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us. So look, they're looking for someone to fill this spot, and there is a pretty hefty requirement here because he said, we need someone that was here from the beginning. We need people that were here from the baptism of John. When John baptized Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him, they need someone that's going to be a witness of all those events that happened from that all the way until the time he was taken up from us, it says, must, must, be, uh, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. 
In order to be a faithful witness and a, and a witness that people are going to believe, they needed someone that's been there the whole time. That can attest, can, can testify in truth and just say, look, I was here from the beginning. I was here when Jesus Christ was baptized throughout his whole ministry. I know that he was dead and he was uh, crucified on that cross. And I saw him resurrected when he, was, um, when he came back from the dead. To be a witness of that, to be able to go and bring that good news and bring the message of salvation to others. They needed to find one. So they had two people here that they were choosing between. It says, and they appointed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. And this is important in all the decisions that we make, especially in the church. If you want to pick a leader, you know, pray to God. Who's the one that God wants? Not just who's the one that, that I like the best, who's the one that, that makes me feel good, but who's the one that, that, that God wants? And that's the same way you ought to pick your church, by the way, too. Don't just pick your church as, Abigail, sit down. Don't just pick your church as, well, who's the, what's the best church that, that's going to make me feel good? Where's the place that I, that I like to go and, and where my friends are going? It's where is the best church that God would want me to be? What would make God happy? And I mean, that's, that's just an attitude that we ought to have in, in our life just completely with, with every, everything that you do. How is it going to please God? It says in, um, in verse 25 that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So they chose Matthias. They decided he was the best man for the, for the job. They figured that, that this is who God wanted, and he was numbered with the eleven. Now, um, the book of Acts is a really exciting book. There's a lot, of, a lot of truth in this book, and there's a lot of stuff that might, might uh, go contrary to what's common or popular preached today. As we saw in the, in the book of Acts, just in chapter number 1, there's, there's some evidence there that of a, of a post-tribulational rapture. And um, we saw Jesus Christ physically arose from the, from the grave by many infallible proofs. And um, you know, I hope you'll stick with this, this, entire, this entire study of the book of Acts and that you're able to, to, to learn something new today. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. For the service, I thank you for Word of Truth Baptist Church, dear God. I pray that you would please just help us to do those things which are pleasing in your sight. Lord, help us to go to you when we when we need to make important decisions. And um, I pray that you would please just let us be aware of, um, of the Judas Iscariots and, and not to just trust every random person that comes in or even not just a random person, just someone who might have been in church for a long time, dear God. Um, just because they're a churchgoer and they might seem good on the outside doesn't mean they're necessarily good on the inside. And let us not be quick to just accuse people, of course. Dear Lord, um, um, we don't know people's hearts. We'll give people a benefit of the doubt, dear God, but um, help us not to just instill too much trust in them where we would let them into a point where they could do some serious damage to us, or to our, especially to our children, dear Lord. There's so many predators out there that, that try to make themselves look good on the outside. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves, and they're just looking to, to seek and destroy um, um, the goodness, dear God. And I pray that you would please just help us to be vigilant, help us to serve you better, dear Lord, and just open up our hearts and our minds to understand your word as we study the book of Acts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.